I think what we're finding out is that ABA scales well operationally, <laughs> but as far as scaling for quality, we're, we're having a problem because what you do in your practice looks very different than what I did in my practice and what I did in my practice looks very different from what the other person does. Hey everyone, welcome to session 196 of the Behavioral Observations podcast. If you care about the future of ABA, it's important to understand not only its strengths, but also the myriad challenges the field faces. And to that end, I can't think of a more difficult challenge the field has right now than figuring out how to adequately measure outcome quality and how this relates to the funding of ABA services. My guest for today is Amanda Ralston, better known as Mandy, to friends and colleagues. And she's been thinking a lot about these issues for quite some time. And she was kind enough to spend some time with me to share her thoughts on this matter. As you'll learn this episode, Mandy's been in the field for over 20 years. She's founded and operated a large statewide ABA provider. She's consulted with large multi-state ABA providers and has just a, a lot more experience in all the areas of operations, upper management, entrepreneurship, et cetera, et cetera. She most recently founded Non-Binary Solutions, which she talks about in the show as well. And for, I guess, the majority of the episode, we talk about the current model of insurance reimbursement for ABA services and contrast that with what's referred to as value-based pay or value-based care. Uh, These payment models differ considerably from the current fee-for-service arrangements that most listeners are familiar with. And while Behavioral Observations is not a healthcare policy podcast, I was encouraged to explore this topic by friends and, uh, I guess, confidants of the show, largely because this treatment model may be coming our way at some point. And uh, given that behavior analysis is not a mature field as of this recording in 2022, uh, especially when it comes to the funding of our services, I thought it would be a good idea to explore this topic in a little bit of detail. Uh, I think if you experience the conversation the same way I did, you'll come to the realization that there are more questions than answers when it comes to value-based care. Uh, And so I might return to this topic from time to time as things develop. Today's episode is brought to you by the 2022 Stone Soup Conference. At the Stone Soup Conference, there are great speakers for a great cause, all for a great price. It's going down on October 22nd or later if you're busy that day, and come here from uh, lots of familiar uh, voices uh, from the podcast and other new ones. Uh, so we've got uh, Kirk Kirby, Drs. Camille Kolu, Nasia Serencioni Ulizi, Meryl Winston, Holly Gover, Tom Higby, and Florence DeGenero Reed. And you can find the link to the Stone Soup Conference in the show notes for this episode. And when you register for it. Use the promo code podcast to save even more. It's a smoking deal, so please check it out. We're also brought to you by HRIC Recruiting. So if you're looking for a job, if you are graduating soon, uh, if you're moving, you're going to want to go to HRI Colorado and schedule a confidential chat with Barb Voss. She knows this field inside out when it comes to recruiting and placement, and she will hook you up. That's HRIColorado.com. Schedule a confidential chat with Barb right away. We're also brought to you by Behavior University, and their mission is to provide university quality professional development to the busy behavior analyst. Learn about all their CEU offerings, including an eight-hour supervision course and an RBT course as well, over at behavioruniversity.com forward slash observations. And last but not least, we're brought to you by the University of Cincinnati Online. They designed a Master's of Education Behavior Analysis program that is 100% online and asynchronous, which means you can log on when it works for you. If you want to learn more, go to online.uc.edu and click the Request Info button for more. And I'll have links to all these things over in the show notes for this episode, which you can find at behavioralobservations.com. So without any further delay, let's get to this really fascinating conversation with Mandy Ralston. Welcome to the Behavioral Observations Podcast, stimulating talk for today's behavior analysts. Now, here's your host, Matt Sicoria. All right, uh, Amanda Ralston, thanks for joining me today on Behavioral Observations. How are you doing? Very good so far. It's good to be on a Friday. <laughs> it is. 
so I am one of my favorite things about doing the show is getting to learn about stuff I have no idea about. And this is the perfect example of that. Uh, and so we're going to be talking about all things values based care. Uh, it's an area that, uh, again, I'm really unfamiliar with, but uh, some folks have asked me to look into it and thought it would be a good topic for discussion on the podcast. Uh, so I reached out to you and you said, hey, I can, I think I know a little bit about that and can speak to it. And so here we are. So thanks for joining me today. Um, I, so we're going to get into that and a whole lot more, but I'd like to start like we always do, Mandy. So please, uh, let's start off by, I'd like to learn about a little bit more about your background, how you got into ABA, uh, what made you want to pursue it as a career, and you can kind of trace it up to what you're doing these days. Sure. Um, well, I I moved from West Virginia, uh, where I was born and raised, to uh, Danville, Kentucky in 1996 to attend Center College. And uh, I transferred in um, to play basketball and run track there. I spent a year uh, with a full scholarship for basketball track in West Virginia Division II school and then decided to leave that uh, that place and, and head down to Center, which was a Division three school, <clears throat> um, and was academically uh, far more rigorous, far more challenging than my, my West Virginia experience. Uh, Center's a very, very bright liberal arts college uh, here in Kentucky. If you're from Kentucky, you know it well. If you don't, the only reason you would know about it is because of uh, the vice presidential debates have been hosted there, I think, twice mm-hmm. at this point. But um, yeah, I, I was pre-med originally, and that turned out to not mix well with being on the road full-time for basketball and track. And uh, so then I decided that psychology looked like something really interesting to me. And my senior semester, my last semester at Center, uh, I had a course called, quote unquote, abnormal psychology. And in it, it told me that one in every 10,000 individuals were diagnosed with something called autism. And uh, I hadn't heard of autism at that point, uh, but I wrote a research paper about it. And I had friends up here in Lexington that were doing some kind of therapy with uh, some families that had children with autism. And they were flying uh, a consultant out from California once every quarter to teach a bunch of high school and college students how to do ABA. Um, And so I ended up following those families for a little bit and observing and asking questions. And then I graduated and I needed a job. And uh, I've always loved kids. um, And I I like interacting with people a lot. And it turned out that uh, I got really, really um, hooked on just working with these folks very, very early. Um, But then we decided that uh, that definitely wasn't the best model um, to be working under. And, you know, only so many people could actually afford that therapy. Um, And especially flying somebody out from California and sharing that cost. So uh, my my friends and I, we, we started hearing about this guy named Dr. Vincent Carbone. And he was uh, uh, traveling around the country and providing three-day workshops to introduce the idea of verbal behavior and why some of the teaching practices might need to change and what we were doing. And so we started lightly stalking him all over the country. And uh, eventually he he offered a 90-hour course in Jacksonville, Florida, uh, which was a boot camp for people that were just getting into the industry of applied behavior analysis. Um, to grandfather in uh, certificates to take the test. And so I went down to Jacksonville. I did that. And then I spent a year sending VHS tapes back and forth in the mail to Dr. Carbone um, and talking on the phone with an actual landline uh, so that, so that I could sit for my exam in uh, 2001 in Nashville. And so that's how I got to be a behavior analyst. Uh, But that's a really long version. I did this last time with Tim Crilly too. He, uh, he admonished me for taking too long with my introduction. No, no, the, you know, it's funny. You know, I go back and forth about whether or not to have this segment of the show. And uh, every time I think about maybe, oh, just we should just go right to the topic. I, I can't tell you how many people are like, we love hearing about how people encounter behavior analysis. So, uh, as, as do I. So that I think uh, no, no, no admonishment for me. I guess. Uh, long story short. So it, it also made me wonder. I, I had I had Vince on the show. Uh, I don't know, like two years ago or something like that. And, and it makes me wonder, like, how many careers he 
spurned, if you will. It, it, you know, uh, it, absolutely. It's, it's probably one of those trees that are just just multiply in and in, in such a way that's just mind boggling. So, yeah, um, yeah. I mean, I, I call him like the the Billy Graham of ABA. Yeah, <laughs> the sort of proselytizing all over the place and just getting everybody fired up about it. <laughs> well, between Billy Graham, uh, landlines and VHS tapes, I think we've, uh, we've solidly sold our, our Gen X credentials here. Uh, so, you know, we might need to put some Wikipedia links in the, in the show notes for today's episode, but that's, that's, uh, that's neither here nor there. All right. So, um, so what are you, what are you doing these days in behavior analysis? Yeah, uh, I am a recovering entrepreneur. Um, you know, hi, I'm Andy, <laughs> and I'm an entrepreneur. Um, so I am on my fourth venture, I guess, at this point. Uh, I've started two different clinics for applied behavior analysis, and I sold the most recent of those two in 2019. Uh, I've opened a, a new uh, organization called non- Non-Binary Solutions. And what I'm hoping to do is to help solve this quandary of quality that we have in applied behavior analysis. I think we've, we've got a real issue on our hands with a lack of standardization um, and a very heterogeneous understanding of what all of our terms mean, what the CPT codes are for, what are our outcomes, what are our metrics. I mean, it, it's all, it's, it's a very, very thick stew, I think at this point. So my, uh, my big, hairy, audacious goal is to try to help fix some of that. Hey there, I'm on the behavioruniversity.com website and I'm checking out some of their webinars that they have and boy, do they look interesting. So I just wanted to share with you a few of these titles. I'm looking at them. Uh, ABA, A Behavioral Approach to ADHD and Anxiety by uh, Dr. Amanda Kelly, aka The Behavior Babe. We've got Autism Services in Rural America, AAC Strategies. Boy, there's a lot of cool stuff here. Behavior-based strategies for childbirth. Uh, I'm sure that's probably of interest given the demographic of the audience consulting in schools. Behavioral systems to improve ethical and professional behavior. And that's by my buddy, Matt Broadhead. Uh, And lots, lots more. Uh, So if you want to check out these and other webinars, as well as RBT trainings and the eight-hour supervision course, go to behavioruniversity.com forward slash observations. All right, let's get back to this conversation with Mandy. All right, so yeah, and I would imagine that theme will probably come up repeatedly during this conversation here of, of quality and 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 related, um, I guess, characteristics. So let's let's get into it. So we want to talk about values based care, and I think an appropriate starting point might be to if you could just spend a, a minute to talk about what. As far as insurance funded services are concerned, what what the current model is, uh, and again, this is perhaps more for 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 my specific benefit because I'm a school consultant, so you know I I don't ha- have to deal with any of that, uh, and I know there are BCBAs who listen to the show who 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 don't deal with uh, you know getting authorizations and things along those lines, um, so. That might be a smaller yeah. portion of the audience, but for those of us who are blissfully unaware of the, the current, you know, I guess what you might consider fee for service model, and you can correct that if I'm wrong. Uh, so tell tell us about the how how services are currently arranged, and um, and then we can get into values based care and how that might be different, I suppose. Yeah, so we currently are operating mostly in a fee for service model. So. Um, you know, we've got our, what, eight, nine different CPT codes that we use for applied behavior analysis at this point. Um, Generally speaking, the different providers will be able to negotiate within a range with some kind of rate with the the insurance companies that they've contracted with. And uh, under those contracts, there is a a model of if you provide um, uh, direct therapy one-to-one with a uh, RBT overseen by a BCBA, you will receive this fee at this unit of time. So per 15 minutes or per 30 minutes, whatever the unit of time is for that, that billable activity. And then likewise, uh, you may have uh, a flat fee in some cases with some different uh, payers where you would have a, an authorization for an assessment. Uh, that assessment uh, would 
have a fixed amount of time that you are supposed to get everything done in, write up your uh, treatment plan, submit all of that, regardless of whether you um, needed 20 hours, but you only had eight, you will get paid just for that eight, for that type of service. So yeah. so that would be like if uh, you were tasked with doing a functional assessment or doing like a VB map or some other type of kind of standard stuff that we do. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So it's, it's putting in your request for authorization. You, you decide you're going to do an initial assessment with this person. You say, I need 10 hours. And they say, well, we're going to approve eight. And at this rate, this is how you will be paid. And then you submit again for a request for authorization for treatment. Uh, and you say, I want this many hours per week with this level of service. And I need this many hours per week and program supervision at this level of service. And uh, they approve you for that uh, based on the evidence that you purport to have to support those recommendations. And I, I only can imagine, and please correct me if I'm wrong, that there's got to be a, a wide variety of responses across all these different payers, whether it's, you know, uh, act, actual companies like, you know, you know, I don't know, uh, Blue Cross, Blue Shield or you know, Aetna or whatever versus, you know, uh, uh, various state sponsored programs and things along those lines. So, you know, it's, it's, it sounds almost kind of dizzying if you're a, an ABA clinic and you've got all these different funding sources and the rules and the reimbursement rates and things like that are, are, are varied across those, those, you know, various uh, insurance funders. Yes, absolutely. I mean, the, the the different funders can have different interpretations about what the codes are for. Uh, the different funders can have different interpretations of medical necessity and how you meet that criteria. They have their own definitions in some cases. Um, and then you have uh, a wide variety of, of difference between just the different people that might be reviewing your plan or your requests. Uh, you could have somebody that is a nurse reviewer. You could have somebody that is a behavior analyst. You could have a behavior analyst that's been in practice. You could have a behavior analyst that's never been in practice. They're, they're strictly an academic behavior analyst. You know, so there, there's a wide array of questions and responses and histories of reinforcement and punishment that these folks have been through themselves that will impact whether you get the things that you're asking for. So. Wow. Well, wow, that seems... Uh, that seems pretty overwhelming. So I, uh, I could see why there's so much discussion of these matters on the various uh, you know, Facebook groups and things along those lines. Um, do, and and do, do you have the perspective to know whether or not that that is similarly variable in, I guess, the non-ABA world? So for example, let's say you're a, 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 like a dental office or if, you know, I'm in physical therapy right now trying to rehab my shoulder. Uh, you know, it, it seems pretty straightforward when I, you know, seek out an alternative uh, healthcare service. Uh, and I, I, I don't know, you know, do you know if it's this kind of, uh, I don't know, insurance roulette that, that exists elsewhere as well, or is it, uh, if not, is it, you know, by dint of the newness of, of applied behavior analysis as a healthcare service? I, I think the problem is the newness of applied behavior analysis as a healthcare service. Uh, obviously, physical therapy, occupational therapy, dental practices, and medicine have been established and been working with insurance far longer than we have. Um, but more specifically than that, there are things that all of those industries have in place that I think we have skipped a few steps and applied behavior analysis, and we okay. don't have ruled uh, at this point. Uh, it just, you know, number one topic, outcomes. What are the outcomes that we're all seeking um, to, to, to produce here with applied behavior analysis as a treatment for autism? You know, with, with medical uh, practices, you've got procedural codes, right? So if I go in and I say, I'm going to do a specific procedure, I'm going to take out your appendix, there's one code and every doctor can agree what that procedure looks like and can actually demonstrate it if they're, you know, actually uh, boarded to do so. Mm-hmm. We don't have procedural codes in applied behavior analysis, which is a different talk show. We could go into why we probably should, but you know, it, it could be the case or it should be the case that if I say I'm going to do a DRO, there should be a procedural code that goes with that. And every behavior analyst should be able to demonstrate what a 
ERO looks like, <laughs> but that's not the case. Again, wow. I don't think we have the standardization in place okay. to actually hold up and say, this is the independent variable that I employed in my treatment. And here's the experimental proof that it actually impacted my outcome. I don't think we're there yet. Hey everyone, just another real quick break. If you are looking for a new job or if you're graduating and you're looking for your first job in behavior analysis, if you're moving, if there's anything else you want to know about anything career-wise in behavior analysis, you're going to want to go to hricolorado.com and schedule a confidential chat with Barb Voss. She's been in the recruiting field for over 30 years and she's been recruiting and placing behavior analysts in our field for oh, about a decade or so. I don't think there's anyone more plugged into the field than she is right now. So if you, again, are looking for a new job, go to hricolorado.com and schedule a confidential chat with Barb right away. All right, let's get back to the interview. The the comparison with those two procedures, I think, is is, is interesting, you know, in terms of, you know, I, I think one of the challenges perhaps of, of of not getting there. And I'm just speculating here because again, I'm just going to cop to my ignorance of this issue, but I'm just kind of trying to apply some level of reason here. But uh, obviously taking an appendix out is a, is a very discreet activity. Uh, and uh, it's uh, it, there's not a lot of mystery to it. And the, it, it, you know, depending on the complications or lack thereof, it could, takes a very short amount of time. The, 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 the proof is instantly verifiable, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, you know, I, I think one of the things that I, I think is interesting is that I, I can't really think of another healthcare service that has the type of intense service arrangement as as that that behavior analysis does. If there is one that you can think of, I'd be I'd I would love to be uh, I'd love to learn about it. But like the you know. Um, you know, like I said, you know, like going, you don't go to the dentist 20 hours a week or 30 hours a week, you know, you don't go to physical therapy that, or any, you know, counseling, whatever. Uh, well, rehabilitation, uh, right. If okay. you're going into a significant rehabilitation for physical therapy after say tearing your ACL or having a major surgery of some type, you know, I think that would be about the most comparable thing that you mm-hmm. can come up with because uh, yeah, there's, there's something also intrinsic about the fact that applied behavior analysis is interactive and the response is ongoing as to how the, the, the patient or the client is actually responding to the treatment. Um, so there's two human beings that are constantly having to respond to each other by employing these different variables. And I think that's uh, very different than, as you point out, a, a procedure like getting a filling or removing an appendix, you know, this, that, that procedure sort of happens in a, a space where you're not having to constantly react to how the patient is actually attuning to that treatment. Right. Whereas with behavioral work and innately, it is about the response to the independent variable and whether or not both parties can, can sort of dance uh, together within that. Got it. Got it. All right. So I think we've uh, we've kind of established where we are right now, warts and all. Uh, and, and so uh, so let's get into the I guess the, uh, the you know the the, the issue of values uh, values based care. So uh, w- what is values based care, and, and w- what makes it different than the the fee for service model? So lots of different uh, names here. You've got values-based care, values-based pricing. You've got pay for performance, pay for quality. Um, The idea is, generally speaking, that you can demonstrate that uh, the the treatments that you are employing uh, as a provider produce said outcomes at a reliable level each time. Right. So I know that when I bring a client into this clinic with my five providers, when we have done the proper assessments and we have identified uh, the treatment goals are appropriate, and these are the things that we decided to do for 20 hours a week, we have demonstrated that we get the outcomes that are actually impacting the wellness of that person, the quality of life for that person. Uh, but that's very complicated, right? So, uh, again, we've got lots of different things to be able to answer uh, about what values-based pace look like for applied behavior analysis. 
you know, just starting with what is the value of applied behavior analysis? Like, what do we actually define that as? Um, again, uh, in healthcare, you know, you think about uh, being able to demonstrate that you are both improving quality of life and reducing co cost uh, to the funder at the same time. So how are we going to demonstrate that through applied behavior analysis? What are, what are the outcomes that we're actually looking for? I see. And, and, and so it, one of the things that I guess I'm curious about is that, you know, if, if you, uh, yeah, how, how, how does that work in terms of like setting costs for various things, you know, for looking at outcomes, what are, you know, well, maybe, let me actually just back up a step here, Mandy. Are, are there, are there agencies or providers running value-based pricing or value-based care models currently? To your knowledge, um, I think there have just started a couple of pilot programs uh, with the Behavioral Health Center for uh, Excellence. Um, I think that they have partnered with Cigna, possibly. I, I'd have to go back and look at it, but uh, okay. I, I know that I've definitely seen an announcement that they are they are attempting to try out a model of some sort. But I'm not sure exactly what they've identified within that model at this point. Okay, and and. Um... So based on that, I, I suppose I'm going to ask you some a lot the a lot of questions that you'll you're, you're probably just going to have to speculate on since we don't have you know kind of a, a test case here to to examine. But you know, I, uh, I I think the fee for service model is 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 inherently I, I guess understandable. I was going to say logical, but there's probably you know <laughs> that that's probably a value judgment. So it's a, probably understandable might be a, a better way to, to phrase it. And uh, you know, I know this is could be a situation where there's you know kind of pros and cons to each each e either way you go. Uh, but what um, so in your and based on your understanding of how this might work, you know how how does someone let's say you know, a, a, a clinic adopted a, a values-based pricing model with, uh, you know, so I've got a, just a gazillion questions around like, how do you price certain things? How do you, you know, what, what does the payment, you know, look like? And, you know, uh, just basically I've got just a, a ton of, I guess, logistical questions, you know, so if I'm someone running a clinic, I, you know, it, I would have all those questions think, and thank goodness I'm not, <laughs> but uh, uh <laughs> You know what, what? What does this look like tangibly? You know, I, I I did I did watch a webinar on this, and it was all at a very high level, and it was all kind of like corporatized MBA speak, and and I I didn't quite. It wasn't nearly as granular as I would have liked because I at the end of the the webinar I I still didn't see I still still didn't see how like, you know, uh, and maybe it's just not ready yet, but I just didn't see how it was implemented. Uh, you know how it could be implemented. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that's the problem, Matt. I, I don't think that we've got all the pieces put together yet in order to extrapolate a, a, a performance for pay model to applied behavior analysis, right? Because it's like with the medical community, you've got um, these programs have been put in place where they've identified like 200 and some odd different outcome measures, right? And if you're in this Medicaid program, then you're allowed to uh, elect into 10 of them that you want to actually report on on a regular basis, right? So you, you're showing your scorecard on those 10 different measures of outcomes for your, for your medical practice. And then based on that, they then compare you to all the other providers in the network and say, how is your performance versus the rest of the bell curve, right? So if you're looking at a distribu distribution of what everybody's performance looks like, are you in the middle of the bell curve or are you at the far right trail of it or are you the far left trail of it? And based on who is performing best, then they're gonna allocate more of their resources towards the providers that are performing well, right? Because they've demonstrated that they're both effective and they reduce costs at the same time because they're getting these patients in, they're treating them, they're getting the outcomes that they want, they're demonstrating wellness, and they're being transitioned on. Um, but because we've got such a mixed bag of what we are understanding, what we want our outcomes to be, you know, is it, are we going to continue to use the Vineland <laughs> as one of our outcome measures, right? Are we going to continue um, to use 
uh, assessments that are not even standardized as part of our outcome measurements, right? Are we going to start looking at uh, reduction in being expelled from school based on behavioral issues? Are we going to look at um, less time uh, for individuals that have been in an, an acute crisis stabilization thing? Are, are, so what are the actual outcomes that we're going to start measuring ourselves on? If we can't answer that question, then we're not going to get to that value-based pay model. Hey, everyone. Last break of this particular podcast. I just want to give a shout out to two of the sponsors. Uh, the first is the uh, 2022 Stone Soup Conference. It's taking place on October 22nd. Just Google Stone Soup 2022 or just go to the show notes to this episode over at behavioralobservations.com and get to link to find out more about it. And be sure to save at checkout using the promo code podcast. I also want to give a quick shout out to the University of Cincinnati Online. They've got a master's in ABA program that is 100% online and asynchronous. You can check them out at uc.online.edu and learn more there. So for links to all these things, again, go to the show notes for this episode. And in the meantime, let's get back to this uh, conversation with Mandy. One of the potential unintended consequences, perhaps, of the fee-for-service model might be that, you know, okay, people can kind of stay in treatment perhaps longer than they might. I don't know, you know, I, um, and, and maybe the, the flip side, and this is, again, this is just me speculating, so I'd love to hear your thoughts on it, you know, from the value-based pricing is that if you get like a fixed amount for a particular um, service, if you will, an assessment or whatever, does that incentivize people kind of like, uh, you know, getting through that assessment or ser- service as, as quickly as possible in order to, you know, uh, trim costs and make the, the process, you know, more efficient and efficient. I don't, you know, I don't mean that. I, I mean that specifically in this case, perhaps in a pejorative sense, I, I suppose, you know, and, and that is not to say that people would do this knowingly or whatever. I'm just aware that, you know, uh, contingencies happen. Right. <laughs> and so, <laughs> so we're, you know, yeah, I mean, if if it's a fee for service and you're given a fixed rate and a fixed amount of time to do it, then as a business, you're going to want to uh, minimize the cost internally, right, and and maximize the efficiency of the process. Um, I don't want to be again too uh, draconian about it or Machiavellian about it, but uh, you know, yeah. It, the fear there is do you put individuals that are less experienced and therefore potentially less costly in to do those types of uh, services, right? Mm-hmm. Because you're going to, you're going to allocate your more senior clinicians towards other things that may have a greater impact in your, your organization. So supervision or developing training or something like that. So, yeah, I think that there's inherently a risk, um, in having that sort of fee for service model with some of these different types of services. And I, I, you know, I think there's pros and cons obviously to both. Um, I I think if we can get to a performance-based pay, I, the experiment is supposed to be, can we improve quality by doing that? And that would be a good thing for the field, but um, we're not going to be able to get there until we can actually start talking the same language about what it is that we do. What are the, uh, I guess, implications for, you know, the the various, you know, one of the things that's interesting about the field right now is you get this kind of diversity of size as it relates to providers. So do you see the size of an agency uh, being an important variable or not uh, relative to one's ability to to eventually adopt the values based care or values based pricing model is that is that something that that's a factor yeah i mean size is going to impact that depending on whether or not the agency themselves has developed standards of care right so i think the mom and pop folks have a better idea about doing that because they've had to train people one by one in their own system and their own ecosphere, 
right? Whereas it, these the larger groups are often conglomerates of lots of different mom and pops, right? So you have to have a standard to which to teach to and which to actually evaluate from in order to actually, again, prove that the recipe that you have, whatever size your organization organization is, is actually effective and therefore performing better than the rest of the field. So until you have a recipe that you can say, this is what we do and this is how we do it, and we can do it over and over and over again and, and achieve the same outcome, you can't get to the rest of it. I think, you know, I think what we're finding out is that ABA scales well operationally, but as far as scaling for quality, we're, we're having a problem because what you do in your practice looks very different than what I did in my practice and what I did in my practice looks very different from what the other person does. You know, we can get 25 behavior analysts in this room and all of us do the same assessment on this one client and we will all have a different idea and approach and treatment independent variables and therefore outcomes. So until so you can standardize the decision-making process and how you actually go about tr- planning your treatments or where you're going for your outcomes, you're not going to be able to scale that. You know, I, I would add to that, I, I guess, one other thing perhaps to put in the mix is that the, the client gets a vote too, you know? So I, I, I you know, I see this as, as, as two issues. There's all the operation side of things, then there's the clinical side of things. And I think as a, as a provider, I would be kind of worried like, oh my gosh, if I get some um, uh, client in here that we are just totally flummoxed with, you know, we've done all, you know, we're, 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 we're taking our toolbox and we're dumping it out on the floor uh, and we, we, you know, can't figure this kid out. Uh, mm-hmm. And that's going to, you know, uh w- does that throw off the whole reimbursement, uh, you know, scheme and things along those lines? And the, I, I think that, you know, as, as, a, as an agency, you know, manager or owner or whatever, that I think that would be the sort of thing that would, I'd be nervous about in terms of a, of a, a fixed cost per a, uh, you know, per. Uh, uh, it is apples the- and oranges. <laughs> okay. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, it's totally apples and oranges. The, the other problem that we have here is the reason that we have the insurance billing to play, pay for applied behavior analysis is because of one diagnosis code and it's autism, right? It's everybody is under the, what is the ICD-9 code for autism? F84.5 or 0.0, right? That's the one code that everybody is able to bill insurance because of. Now, does everybody coming into these clinics just have autism? And does all of that autism look alike? Mm. <laughs> no, it is drastically different. And I think, A, we've done a big disservice to the individuals on the autism spectrum by lumping everybody under one diagnosis, label and code, because we all know they are drastically different individuals, right? And and how their quality of life needs uh, uh come for each of them is very different as well, right? And then you've got the fact that you've got individuals that have an autism diagnosis, but they also may have a secondary diagnosis and a third diagnosis, and they could also have medical comorbidities, and they've got different medications that they're taking, and they could have a history of trauma, they could have a history of abuse or neglect. I mean, and all you're doing is trying to compare all of these people under one code, autism, F. 84. <laughs> and it's, it's, it's not going to work. It's like, that's right. Right. It's, it's, it's not going to, it's, it's like trying to say, well, how's everybody doing working on cancer? <laughs> right. Like which cancer, right? You, you can't operate that way. So it's apples and oranges. You've already met, mentioned a couple of things uh, about, you know, c- some of the things that we, we lack as a field and, that, and it may be worthwhile to just to pause and kind of just kind of, uh, Re- reboot that list, if you will, in terms of things that we would need to do to, I guess, uh, get ready for for something like this. And I see, I keep saying get ready because I just, I just hear people say values based care is coming, it's coming, like it's you know, and I, you know, and, and and these are just the, you know, I, I, and I don't know the extent to which that's true or not, um, but it's it's something I'm hearing more and more about it in 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 the, I guess the 
the, the chatter, if you will. H- having said that, so again, if we were to create a laundry list of the things that would be necessary to 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 implement something like this, what what would be the things that uh, that that you would say we'd need to uh, come together on as a field? Yeah. So the biggest thing is is getting everybody to start speaking the same languages, right? Um, talking about what are our actual outcomes. We got to define our actual outcomes and we've got a few different outcome um, frameworks that have been released this year, this past year. Uh, BICO, the Behavioral Health Center of Excellence has released theirs. Um, We've got iCHOM has released a, a framework of different assessment tools that they believe will be able to measure outcomes for autism. ICHOM, I'm sorry, can um, you... Uh... ICHOM is the International Consortium for Health Objective Measures. I could have completely butchered that. Okay. We've gotten it absolutely we'll look it right. Up. We'll look it up and put yeah. it in the show notes. So we've got ICHOM's framework. We've got um, CASP, the Council of Autism Service Providers, is also working on a framework of some sort to try to help people understand how to, to evaluate uh, their quality, right? And so people have released these frameworks, but we don't have, again, a recipe about how to go about choosing which of these different assessment tools based on the the individual that's facing you. And we don't have any data yet about how effective any of those frameworks are, right? So it's very, very nascent at this point about what are our outcomes how do we select which types of tools we want to use and are those tools effective? And so I think outside of getting on the same page and stop working in silos and actually start bringing all this information together and sharing the information so that we can figure out what actually is effective, we've got to look at our data. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Um, We've got so much data and I bet we haven't looked at a lot of it. Um, You know, a lot of it is locked up in in big, electronic medical record groups. Um, and that, that data needs to be loosened up so we can actually evaluate uh, what, what is actually effective at this point and what's not uh, so that we can stop doing that. Um, you know, I, I've got a friend of mine that, that likes to say the, the road to hell is paved with data that you never look at. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and, and it's true. You know, it's it, my, one of my other things is like behavior analyst, heal thyself, right? Oh, like, of course. Look at your data, right? Look at your data. If you're not actually taking the data and you're not looking at it, it's, it's really not going to do you any good. I think we need to look at what are the gaps in care within applied behavior analysis. You know, it's, it's like, I think we've had a lot of people uh, running directly at early intervention because that's where the the most of our research has been. Um, But I think we've got a lot of folks that we need to get more data, more research, more care involved for people that have uh, significantly uh, impacted by their autism or profound autism, right? Likewise, I think we need to look at, uh, you know, for folks that need help with uh, job training um, and social skills and and dating, right? Uh, financial services, just some of those higher level skills uh, that, that might be needed. So uh, I think we've got to get our arms around, again, what this this large spectrum of a population actually needs and looks for look for the gaps in care. I can only imagine uh, trying to figure out outcomes for those, uh, you know, kind of uh, complex repertoires has to just be incredibly challenging as well. If we're going to standardize outcomes or standardize how we talk about them, you know, dating, right. <laughs> dating's complicated. No one's got the, you know, I, I, or, you know. Yeah, I'm not yeah. going to tackle that one. Yeah. It's definitely not, <laughs> not my but, wheelhouse. You know, <laughs> right, right, yeah. Uh, so, anyway, I, I got you off track there. But is, what That's else fine. would you, would you say that, uh, that that needs to be you know kind of put on the microscope to um, per- perhaps move move in a direction that's more, uh, I guess, um, that, that that would make this uh, values based model work better or work more, more likely to work. Yeah, I mean, I, th- I think the the BACB signaled this with their their new ethics code. I think collaboration is key. 
you know, that we've got to work with the other providers that are working with our clients uh, and very much including the primary care provider, the physicians. Like we need to be sharing our data. We need to be understanding what all types of treatments and interventions are happening concurrent to what we're doing. Um, And again, get out of our silos, uh, listen to the other colleagues that we're working with. You know, we don't know everything there is to know about speech therapy. Uh, We, you know, behavior analysts have a, a tendency to say, because it's behavior, it's in my, it's in my wheelhouse. Right. Mm. And that's, that's everything. Well, I, I think I'm pretty sure I'm not an expert on everything. Yeah. So uh, we, we need to really start collaborating with people that have specialities uh, and understanding different parts of what our clients need. Got it. Got it. Uh I'm going to ask this question and I hate it when people ask me these types of questions, uh, but I'm going to ask it anyway. So, um, you know, do you, do you think, uh, you know, where do you see this issue? Uh, I was going to say five years down the road, but you could, you could use whatever, whatever length of time that you, you think is useful here in answering that, you know? So, you know, if we were to get in a time machine and jump ahead a couple of years, where do you see values based pricing or values based care in in the in the realm of ABA services? Um, I think it's going to take at least five years to get there. That's my personal opinion. I'm not an expert on any of this. This is just you know the thing, the ideas that I've cobbled together and looking around, um, because I think we have so much work to do about standardizing our practices uh, first. And I also think that. ABA is in the middle of an existential crisis, right? Like, are we actually effective? You know, we've, we got here because we had a lot of very uh, grassroots, passionate parents that went to battle for us and said, our kids need this therapy and they need the therapy paid for, right? So they went to the lobbyists, they went to Washington, they went to Autism Speaks, they got all these insurance mandates passed. Um, and they did that because they saw the effects that the treatments were having for their kids. They had very compelling stories about the quality of what was happening and the changes in their lives. I, I now have a child that can eat more than five foods. I, I now have a child that you know will run to me and can ask for what he wants. He can tell me when he's hurt and so on and so forth. But what we don't have to go with that is that quantitative data. We've got lots of good stories um, about the effects of applied behavior analysis and what kind of outcomes parents can tell us that their, their children had as a result of this therapy. We've got less quantitative data and the data that is being looked at in some cases, you know, the TRICARE report uh, that came out a couple of years ago uh, didn't paint a very good picture about what our quantitative data says about the effectiveness of ABA. So I think let's not jump to values-based pay without fixing the fact that we need to get our quality straightened out first. Mm-hmm. Okay. So. Okay. Fair enough. Uh, all right. Uh, so, so this has been an incredibly eye-opening uh, uh, conversation. So I appreciate you, you know, and, and again, this is all in the realm of kind of speculation. So I appreciate you going out on the limb here uh, with me, Mandy. So uh, thank you so much for educating me on this topic. I'm sure there's more to say on this. Uh, so, um, I'll, I'll probably return to this at some point in the future. Um, so, uh, I guess last question for you, uh, we always end with this question. So, uh, what, what advice do you have for the newly minted BCBA or BCBAs of any experience level for that matter? Yeah, I think, uh, the advice is to find a good mentor, um, and to, know that it's going to be okay to make mistakes. Um, you're going to make mistakes in your first year and you're going to make your, you're going to make mistakes in your 20th year. And it is by nature of the career that you've chosen that that's going to be the case. Because if you think what you're doing today as best practices is going to be the same in five, 10 or 20 years, I think you can look at the field of psychology or counseling or any other field close to ours and know that that's not going to be the case. So it's, um, it's good to surround yourself with people that have made mistakes and have learned from them and can be gracious with themselves and with you who are going to make mistakes. All right. All right. I, I, I like that. Thank you very much.
Thank you, Matt, for letting me uh, come in here and pontificate on a, a topic that, like I said, is uh, largely cobbled together from just my own experience and, and, and noodling around. So I appreciate it. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for listening to the Behavioral Observations Podcast with Matt Sicoria. You can find Matt's notes on this episode at www.behavioralobservations.com. We also invite you to stay connected with us on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash behavioral observations and on Twitter at Behavior Podcast. 